to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How about you? Tired, actually. Yeah, I'm beat. <laughs> it's been a long week. Yeah. It's Friday. Yeah, thank goodness. Yeah, not Friday for me, but it's the day Friday. <laughs> I still the... got a few more days before my day off. <laughs> oh, well, I. it's Friday for me. It's Friday for you? Yeah, yeah. it's Friday for me. Yeah. Um. I don't know where you want to start. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. So, man. We can jump right in. We can yeah. banter a little bit. I don't have anything particular to say. To Yeah. So have you watched any of the hearings for the Supreme Court nominee? I have not. I watched. The I little... would like to. I've been I've been um, absorbed in uh, foreign affairs, foreign affairs. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. No, I get that. So I watched. um a fair amount of it earlier this week. Um, I say a fair amount, like probably an hour's worth of them actually giving testimony and, and discussing. Mm-hmm. And I watched some of the coverage kind of as they took breaks and stuff too. Yeah. And, and probably a good half hour to an hour of that part too, just the coverage. Um, it's really kind of amazing. Like they don't, the coverage is you if if you really want to know what's going on, you need to watch some of the hearings. Even if you don't watch it all, like maybe catch some some mashups of some stuff that was said um, by both sides, Republicans and Democrats, because you're not getting anything from the coverage. The coverage I saw was complete garbage, which was kind of crazy to me. So they had just been in there. And they, I'm sure that the people that were talking about it were listening to the same thing I listened to, but you would hope <laughs> you would hope. Yeah. But when you listen to them talk immediately after when they're in the breaks, like it's like they didn't hear the same conversation I just heard, mm-hmm. and it was it was kind of amazing. So an example of that was um, when I turned it on, they were in a break, and so they were talking about um, how this how the the Republicans were really grilling her about being soft on crime. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, she's soft on crime. This may be a good nominee. I'm, I, and that actually is what drew me in to continue watching. I was like, man, I want to hear some of this. Maybe yeah. I, I think I'm, I might like this person. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so then I started watching the, the the actual hearings. And I was like, whoa, she's soft on crime the wrong way. Yeah, like this, so. This is about the uh, pedophilia and uh, yeah. So child I had I had missed the pedophilia part, but this was the, I came in after the trial. So they were talking about the portion where they had done the pedophilia stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's where they were talking about soft on crime. So when I was listening to the coverage, I was like, oh man, soft on crime, this person's going to be awesome. And then they'd lead in and they're like, well, we're not... The, and, and of course it was... Um, Ted Cruz was the main speaker through a lot of it. Yeah, um, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I'm not a big fan, <laughs> but but he was solid. Like if you mm-hmm. listen to any, particularly the one he did, because I, I came in listening to where he was talking about the... Um, the child porn stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's, you can tell he was an attorney, like he was grilling yeah. her hard about it. Um, and I, I didn't really disagree with much he had to say. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I felt like it was all fair points. Um, and it, it was one of those deals to me, like, okay, she's probably going to get the nomination either way. But I think she's a horrible person. Yeah. <laughs> like anybody that would be, because what she did, what Ted Cruz's main point was was that you that that she gave substantially lighter sentences than what was recommended by anybody. Yeah, I I understand she was like giving six month sentences when the recommendations were like ten years. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, you know they talk about it as uh, just like child pornography and and um, like. So I haven't dug into this myself, but in some of the coverage that I've seen um, where they were looking at some of these cases, Hmm. it was things like uh, people uh, crossing state lines to solicit sex from a a minor and stuff like that. Well, the Um, one it's not it's not like, oh, well, you know, some guy had, uh, you know, pornography of teenagers on his computer or or anything. And then like the big one that I heard was um, that one of these cases it was a father who had taken pictures of his daughter. And yeah, had, that was I mean, the case I was fixing the reference um, was that, yeah, one of the cases, the kid, the, the father had taken a bunch of, of his like 
10 year old daughter or something like that yeah. and um taking a bunch of pictures of her and was trying to trade them to other people for other pictures was what <laughs> what he was accused of doing which by the way all of these all of the ones where i watched where they were talking about the pornography stuff were um all of those people had pled guilty like mm -hmm. th so these were plea deals which was part of the reason that they were supposed to receive a, a lighter sentence uh, because they mm -hmm. had pled out but when they, when they're recommending ten years and you're given less than a year, I'm sorry, I don't care if they pled out or not. That's excessively light. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that um, if you think that it's appropriate for her to not um, severely punish like this guy, uh, then you may as well come over completely to our camp and be an anarchist. Because if if you think <laughs> yeah. that government is is valuable for it has any role in life it seems to me that it should be to protect this children <laughs> this is the place yeah. and and this is one of those situations where i'm an anarchist but i i don't care who's punishing mm -hmm. these people yeah they need to be punished and if it's the government so be it like i'm that's yeah if government ever had a role this was it mm -hmm. <laughs> um so and yeah i can't i mean i all i could think the whole time when i was watching it was man, like she is just a horrible person. And it wasn't just one case. It wasn't like these were, so he had, because her defense of it was, well, you've cherry picked a, a handful of cases I've, I've, um, drooled on and are using those. And, and Ted Cruz had them all on a big board. And he was like, these are all of your child pornography cases. You're welcome to comment on any of them. He mm -hmm. was like, comment on any of them. I don't care. I, I want to have a discussion about why these verdicts or why these judgments were so low. Yeah. And she, of course, she was not having that conversation. Like she wouldn't, wouldn't even engage in that. Yeah. Um, um, I also did hear, uh, a clip and this is, um, oh gosh, I'm now I'm trying to think of the, how the detail, it was something about, uh, somebody asking her to, to define woman. Oh, so yes, I did see that too, and that's been that's been all the rage on social media because see, I, her I response that, is just classic. Yeah, man. I, I, yeah, I'm not a biologist, yeah. right? Um, so <laughs> yeah. I I don't think that this is particularly relevant, nah, but I, I hate that kind of response. I, yeah. I um I saw another clip. Of, I think it was an Australian woman um talking about um you know this coming up in swimming recently, like yes, one of these yes. uh, cases in swimming, yeah. and um the you know she's arguing with some guy in the stands about uh how you know these are men swimming as women and and he's like well you know are you a biologist and she's like no what kind of stupid response is that <laughs> she says i'm not a veteran uh, um i'm not a I'm not a vet either. I'm not a veterinarian either, but I know what a dog is. Yeah. My favorite ones. Well, I'm not a weatherman, but I know if it's raining outside or yeah. not. Like, uh, I mean, come on guys. Like this is insane. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, it, it actually, it highlights something that comes up a lot, a lot in our news right now, which is this appeal to authority. Yeah. Uh, we've seen it throughout COVID and you say, you know, appeal to authority. That seems like that would be a somewhat positive thing, yeah. but it, it's actually a logical fallacy. Yeah. Um, that you depend on rather than evidence, somebody who's supposed to be an expert telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's not a, it's not a strong argument. Yeah. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, well, I, I think, uh, you know, probably unfortunately in the end, it won't matter yeah. here. Um, most of the stuff that's going on in my experience in these kind of hearings, especially in an election year, um, is people trying to get their sound bites for their for campaigns. their campaigns, and and that's really all this is. Um, there was it's a bunch one of grandstanding. Other, there was one other thing that was mentioned in the coverage in between, which the after so after I watched that section of the hearing where they were going over the child pornography stuff, I was like, dude, this I can't believe this person's fixing the uh, that that anybody that sat there and listened to what I just listened to mm -hmm. could support this person. Yeah. Because I couldn't. Um but then the coverage afterwards was of course they didn't address anything that was said during but they but they talked about what was it's weird this weird thing where you like you can talk about it without really mentioning all of the bad stuff you just heard, you know? Okay. And one of the things one of the ladies was saying was, um, well, the, the Republicans have really taken a different angle with this Supreme Court justice, and it's really more like um, 
uh, uh, what you call it when you um, where like political campaigns do like opposition research. Oh, okay. Like it, it, this this was really more of like an opposition research um, going to smear your your um, your your opponent type s- situation. Mm-hmm. And I was like. Yeah, I mean that's fair enough. Like I'm sure I mean they're absolutely trying to smear her, but they're rightly so. <laughs> like I mean this yeah. the, these these judgments happened and nobody's disputing any of that. Um and all of this happened. Like I mean it's not that to me yeah, there's it's a di- documented. Yeah, there's... it's documented and and nobody's disputing it. To me there's a difference there between that and like opposition research where you're just trying to make stuff up about your opponent. Well, I, I mean, I know that that's what opposition research has come to mean, but I think the yeah. opposition research was originally supposed to be like digging up the, yeah, the factual the information finding, about finding the skeletons in the closet, right? But this is absolutely a skeleton in her closet. Like this is absolutely a legitimate thing that's a problem for. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's just it's amazing to me. Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, so. there. Um, there has been a push to normalize all kind of all kinds of uh, sexual deviancy. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't even mean that expression with judgment in most cases. Yeah. Um, but pedophilia is a <laughs> truly deviant and really like subversive and you know i don't like using terms like good and evil and so forth but this is yeah. like a really like really terrible exploitative um and exploiting people that have like are the this, most innocent and least able to protect themselves yeah and, and something that's <clears throat> going to stay with these people for the these kids for the rest of their lives yeah i mean I don't know. It's I can't I can't imagine. I think those are the worst kind of criminal, criminals. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And like I say, her a, a big <clears throat> other thing that she kept mentioning that was that well, you know, this is Congress's job to to bring up mandatory minimums or something mm-hmm. like that. And I'm like, I'm I'm not a fan of mandatory minimums. No, no, no. That's I'm, a that's a cop out anyway. It is. Like the the whole point of being a judge is to use good judgment. To like use the, good judgment. Oh, it's exactly. supposed to be subjective. I I think that the law is supposed to be subjective. Yeah, and I, mean, I have no problem with the, that. The administration of justice is supposed to be subjective. Absolutely. It should be couched in the um in the details of what happened. Yeah. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, and, and, there was, and it's the role of the judge to be that subjective. If this was, if, if these cases were presented differently where it was like, well, there was one or two that had a lighter sentence, but the rest she had thrown the book at, mm-hmm. it would have been like, well, there's no argument here. Like right. I, I, I would have been like, dude, y'all are, I mean, y'all are taking a couple of cases and cherry picking exactly mm-hmm. like what she was saying. I was like, yeah. okay, I don't know the details between those two few cases mm-hmm. where she made a judgment I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not the case here. It was overall, all of the cases that she had in front of her like this, that was the judgment she made was to go well below, substantially below what the, what it should have been. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, like I say, it, it blows my mind that, that we're going to have a Supreme court justice that has done this and is going to be in court, and I don't support mandatory minimums on any on any crimes. Yeah. Um, even these, as much as I am against and and as hardcore against these crimes as anybody, it deserves vigilante justice. I, I'm all for vigilante <laughs> justice, actually. And, and no, we can't say that. Well, <laughs> oh my bad. That I was, mean, that that was, was comedic. Was, that was satire. <laughs> right. But but yeah, I mean, um, there. I'm not for even in these cases. I'm not for mandatory minimums. I still think a judge should have have that ability to make a decision, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And based on recommendations from the jury and so forth, I I do think that there's, you know, a lot of reason to, if you're going to make mandatory minimums and make it an objective thing, you may as well take the judge and the jury out of it and just plug all the info into a computer and see what pops out. Yeah. Right. Like, uh, exactly. Otherwise, uh, you know, if it has to be, if it's supposed to be objective, there's no point in having these people make the decision. Right. Yeah. And the whole, it, what you're talking about though, is that it seems that, um, this is a person who has, who has exercised at least in these cases or these kinds of cases, poor judgment. Yeah. And that seems to be a really important factor to consider when choosing whether to make her one of the highest judges in the land. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Worst kind of criminals. Except maybe yeah. war criminals. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, a lot of talk now. Putin is a war criminal. Yeah. Putin yeah. is a war criminal. Um, and I don't I, even I, necessarily disagree with that. But yeah. if we're going to classify him as a war criminal, <laughs> I think we got to do a little looking at home is yeah. all I'm going to say. Yeah. I, I See, the whole thing just kind of confuses me, honestly, because I don't know how the U.S. would intend to prosecute War crimes, anyway. Yeah. Because the the traditional the the international body that prosecutes war crimes is the um, uh, oh gosh, the ICC. What does it stand for? Uh, international Criminal Court. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the U.S. doesn't recognize the ICC because <laughs> the ICC has accused the U.S. of war crimes on more than one occasion. Yeah. Um, and in you may remember it was just a few years ago, like 2017, 2018. Um, when John Bolton as the Secretary of Defense, state, state, Secretary of State, I think. Don't quote me. Yeah, the two. Yeah. It, the so, whole idea that he was in a position of power just right. bugs me. So. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, and uh, like to me, like uh, Blinken and uh, Sullivan are essentially the same person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right. Like I, I always get Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense confused, at least in this country, because they seem to have the same role. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just a few years ago where John Bolton threatened um, sanctions on the ICC, on the members of the ICC. Actually, I think that they even enacted sanctions on the members of the ICC uh, for talking about prosecuting war crimes uh, by the U.S. in Afghanistan, like yeah. specifically torture of prisoners. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I don't know what the U.S. Pl would plan to do about this anyway. No. Um, it's not like that. Well, Certainly, the U.S. believes that it has um, has judicial jurisdiction over the entire world for some reason. Yeah, um, but we're, not everybody agrees. <laughs> we're, we're the empire, man. Yeah, like, that's <laughs> not everybody agrees with that. So I don't know where they would be looking to prosecute Vladimir Putin or his generals or soldiers or whatever for war crimes because it, it seems like the U.S. should not be able to bring it to the ICC. Yeah, since the U.S. isn't a party to the ICC. Right. Um. Mm. And, uh, yeah, um, I, no, nah, yeah, I'm not going to say that there's no war crimes going on in Ukraine. Um, I, I've, you uh, know, I, I mean, think that me in general, I, I have a problem anytime one country invades another. Yes. Like, I mean, I, and I'm not absolutely saying that that, it, that act is a war crime, but I'm say, not saying it's not either. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, there's <laughs> definitely like when you're the aggressor in a situation like that, you're not exactly the good guy. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, like, and as we've been saying all along, well, uh, this, there are reasons for this. Yeah. It's, it's not reasonable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's not justified. Uh, what's happened. So, and it's um, important to under, even in a, a good example that I've heard used a few times is um, Osama bin Laden. When mm -hmm. he attacked us on 9 11, like nobody, the media didn't cover any of why we were attacked or any of that, anything he had to say about what was done. It was all, well, they hate us for our freedom. Yeah. Um, and that was nowhere on his list of, of uh, grievances reasons when he declared yeah, war. Yeah. And I mean, he had, he did have real grievances. Now, once again, I absolutely, I don't think anybody in this country really would, would say that. What that his grievances were justified and he was right in what he did, but at the same time, it's important to understand why he did what he did, you know, even yeah. even if it's not justified. And this is the same type thing with Putin and in Ukraine. Like it's even though what he's doing isn't justified, it's important to know why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah, and he's made it very clear. He's been complaining about the same things for a long time. Um, what you were saying there, though, reminded me of something. So um, Anthony Blinken, speaking of him, right. uh, gave a speech like a week ago. And in it, he said this. And I, I thought, um, so I'm just pulling one paragraph out of it. It was, you know, a few pages. Yeah. Uh, I read it. I didn't hear it. I <laughs> yeah. do transcripts. But um, <laughs> anyway, I just thought that this was so indicative of the U.S.'s inability to reflect on itself yeah. uh, and its own actions. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, so he says, uh, so here we have one of the permanent members of that council. He's talking about the U.N. Security Council. Yeah. Um, not only not maintaining international peace and security, but exploding it by attacking another country and attacking some of the basic principles that are at the heart of the United Nations Charter and these international understandings that were designed to prevent wars from happening again. Like states deserve to have their sovereignty respected. Like they need to have their territorial integrity respected. One country can't simply go in and change the borders of another by force or dictate to, its, to it its choices, its future, its policies with whom it's going to associate. Yeah. Now, I thought he's <laughs> talking about Russia here. But, but, but all of that applies straight back at us. Yeah. I mean, you might think that Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, like some of these countries might have some commentary on the U.S. Yeah. in this regard. Absolutely. Um, and then if you're just talking about the U.N. generally, uh, Libya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about Yugoslavia? Yeah. Where they just went in and and split it up into four countries or whatever all, all those years. People forget about that war, but, yeah. and, you know, while Clinton was in office um and i can't remember it was around the whole uh dress fiasco Ah, and stuff going on in the oval office and um i can't remember if it if attacking yugoslavia was his victory lap or his distraction at this point but but it was all kind of happening at the the same time um and uh yeah it it is a, a really um prime example of uh, accusing others of what you do. Yeah. And the difference is that the U S thinks that it's justified in all its actions and the, that it, it is capable of doing this because it's the world empire. Well, um, I just and, won't... and they, they truly believe that the U S is responsible for maintaining some international order of the which world. they make the rules and then they ignore them. Yeah. Like the U S creates these rules and then it picks and chooses who has to abide by them. Well, I just want everybody to kind of keep in mind, too, like if we hadn't have went into Iraq and Afghanistan and all of these other countries over the past 20 years, I don't know that Russia would be as as bold to just jump into another country. Mm -hmm. But we've kind of set the precedent that, you know, this is still okay. Yeah. Well, up until Syria, actually, like Russia was mostly on our side. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like there's (laughs) there we're a big cause of this and mm-hmm. and it's not it's not good man well um you know back to the international criminal court when the us was accused of war crimes uh we just told them to go f themselves essentially yeah. um and we ignored it yeah. and <laughs> said we're not a party to this bring we your don't, military we don't recognize the power of the international criminal court yeah well russia doesn't either yeah. Russia didn't sign on to the International Criminal Court either. So even if you make accusations against Russia through the International Criminal Court, why can't they do the same thing that the U.S. did and said, you know what, we don't recognize your authority, and so we're not answering this? Yeah. Well, and and what's the retort to that? Because, like, especially when we were doing it, like, I mean, do that? Do, do they have an army? Are they going to bring their army over here to come enforce any penalties they put on us yeah yeah what are they gonna do what are they right? gonna do to us and the same thing with russia like the mm-hmm. all the only thing that could happen is for a bigger power to step in and be like okay well we're gonna actually enforce this except that the u.s has shown itself to be the u.n's army exactly exactly um well i the other thing that has really stood out to me on this is the overuse of the word genocide ah okay all right you're talking about thousands of civilian deaths which is terrible yeah. But that is not a genocide. Yeah. It is n- nowhere close, I would say, to meeting the definition of a genocide. And in fact, I would say probably the only genocide going on in the world right now is in Yemen. I was fixing to say, there's, <laughs> I know of one going on in the world right now, and it's Yemen. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in Yemen, the U.S. is mostly responsible. The yeah. U.S. has provi- provided the weapons. I, yeah. I mean, it says the Saudi-led coalition, but it's the U.S., Navy yeah. that's enforcing the blockade that's preventing food and medicine from entering the country. Yeah. It's the U.S. weapons maintenance um, and training that has allowed the Saudis to uh, launch attacks into Yemen. Um, it is U.S. targeting information that they're using to hit civilian facilities like water treatment plants and hospitals and so forth. Same kind of things that we're accusing Russia of. Yeah. Um, where the the Saudi military is definitely targeting civilian facilities. Yeah. With the intent of creating a medieval t- siege type situation to um, create famine 
which they've succeeded which in they've doing. Done, yeah. Um, yeah. And widespread disease, worst cholera epidemic in a, a century or something like that. I yeah. mean, all these things are happening with the complete support of the U.S. Yeah. Um, and and what's more, not just the complete support of the U.S., but it couldn't be done without, without the U.S. Us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and that's your tax dollars, people. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and just to, to put some numbers into it, uh, the U.N. has... Um, estimated, and they they expected that it's a low low ball estimate. Yeah. Um, but they have estimated that uh, the Yemen war has killed three hundred and seventy seven thousand people by the end of twenty twenty one. It started in twenty fifteen, I yeah. think. That, that seems sound, right. That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and uh, more than a quarter million of those three hundred seventy seven thousand, something like seventy percent of those three hundred seventy seven thousand people that have died in the Yemen war, yeah, were under five years old. Yeah. Yeah. That's a genocide. Oh, absolutely. So, um, and speaking of, yeah. uh, Madeleine Albright died. Yes, I heard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I... Just on the line of, you know, maybe if she were asked the question, if uh, the deaths of a quarter million children in Yemen are worth it to, uh, remember, placate the Saudis over the JCPOA. Because yeah. that's why... That's why Obama entered this war with the uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE yeah. originally was because Saudi Arabia was upset about us signing the uh, nuclear deal with Iran. Yeah. And so in order to play, quote, placate the Saudis, yeah. we have launched this war of genocide in Yemen. So um, I wonder if Madeleine Albright, if asked if it is worth it, yeah. How what she would, she would answer. <laughs> because... Let's flash back a few years <laughs> yeah. um, to uh, the war going on, the bombing. Not It wasn't yeah. even a war, or at least yeah. not declared. Yeah. Um, the bombing going on in Iraq when M Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State under Bill Clinton. And yeah. she was on 60 Minutes. And here's the question. All right. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when in, in Hiroshima. And... and you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Yeah, that was to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Yeah, all right. Half a million Iraqi children is worth it. Uh, we think that's the price we're willing to pay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think that all of this bears remembering when we're talking about what like the atrocities that Russia is committing in Ukraine, yeah. not to justify them, but to put them into perspective because the U S has been doing this for a long time too. Yeah. And all of you out there that are protesting against Russia probably should spend some time protesting against the U S wars that are still going on. Yeah. What, where were you when we were against the wars that we were committing? Yeah. <laughs> like, come on now, like let's be consistent here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Russia may be the evil empire, but I, that doesn't make us the good guys. Yeah. And, and something just like I was saying earlier, like that's our tax dollars. Like if, if the American people stood up and really pitched a fit, we could stop this. Mm -hmm. We could, as far as our wars are concerned. Yeah. Um, I and then mean, we would be in a much better moral position to comment on other people's absolutely. actions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is our government. Like, we can do something about this, but it, it takes it takes people understanding, and it takes a media that's not just going to brush the stuff under the rug, mm -hmm. because that's how they get away with it. Is that that the media doesn't cover it? Yeah. So that's like Yemen. Like, I'm sure most of the people that listen to our podcast are familiar with Yemen, mm -hmm. but outside of that, very few. Yeah. You talk to just people on the street; they don't know. Yeah, my mom is a news watcher, and she knows about Yemen now because I've talked to her because about it plenty. Because you put it in front of her, um, yeah. But it, I don't know, it was probably 2018. It had been yeah. going on for three years or, or however long at that point. Yeah. Um, when uh, she was talking about, I can't even remember what the issue was at the time, but uh, you know, hum humanitarian crisis. And yeah. I said, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world right now is our war in Yemen. Yeah. And she wasn't sure what I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. She was like, that can't be true. I'm like, no, it, it, it is. is. And and every now and then one of the stations will do like a little thing on Yemen. Mm -hmm. But it's like they gloss over the fact that we're supporting all of it. Because I've yeah. watched some of these where they talk about Saudi Arabia and what they're doing and how bad it is and the humanitarian crisis. And I'm like, okay, 
finish that up, like bring it home, yeah. and they never do. Yeah. Well, and the, probably the well, it's not the worst thing about it, but the worst thing it should be the worst thing from our perspective. Yeah. Um, about it, other than the, you know the deaths of a quarter million children. Yeah. Uh, is that it is a treasonous war. Yeah. Um, for Obama to have engaged in in the first place because yeah. the people that we are supporting in this war, um, the Saudis and the UAE, yeah. uh, were fighting alongside uh, AQAP. Yeah. Uh, which is, okay, for, yeah, I'm just like throwing... <laughs> Acronyms out there <laughs> yeah. at people. <laughs> um, it is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It is yeah. our enemies. It is the people that attacked us in 9-11, the, probably the only group of people that we could make any kind of justification for about treason. being at war yeah. with, um, instead of fighting against them. Yeah. And, and actually, we had been fighting against them in Yemen. Yeah. Um, we were fighting on, alongside the Houthis against AQAP yeah. uh, until this reversal after the JCPOA to placate the Saudis. Yeah. And then we switched sides and joined the side of Al-Qaeda yeah. fighting yeah. against the Houthis. Mm. So, you know, there's no, <laughs> I don't, yeah. there's no words really. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can't make it up. Like, it's yeah. so, it's so cartoonish. And, uh. And then, um, as far as like what's going on in Ukraine right now, I think that it has been exaggerated a bit. And so I heard this. I heard this clip the other day, um, and uh, and so I grabbed this news clip because, you know, we've been talking about how well the civilian deaths seem awfully low for them to be making claims that the um, that the Russians are wantonly attacking civilian populations and so forth. Yeah. Um, when there's you know by their own accounts, like four times as many Russian soldiers dead as there are Ukrainian civilians dead. It's hard to imagine that they're like actively attacking civilians. Yeah. Um, and then, but you know, you do have like, you do have some incidents that definitely involve deaths of civilians, the, you know, things that hit apartment complexes and what have you. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why this didn't occur to me before, Yeah. but I heard this news report and I, I I feel like they kind of said the quiet part out loud. Yeah. Um. And so let me let me play this real quick. All right. In Kiev, a son cries over the body of his mother, <laughs> killed when a downed missile sent shrapnel and shards of glass tearing through the neighborhood. The Ukrainian military said this is the result of a missile that was intercepted, and you can see the level of destruction. Every single window is smashed out. Not just here but in the surrounding buildings. Imagine if this was a direct hit. All right, the thing that really gets me about that clip is at the end when he says, um, imagine if it had been a direct hit. <laughs> because what he said, in case you didn't catch it or it didn't register for you, is that the, the damage was done by a downed missile, yeah. an intercepted missile. Yeah. And so my thought was, well, if it had been a direct hit, it probably would have hit a military target, not a civilian one. Yeah, it would have hit its intended target, <laughs> which was more than likely, you don't know, maybe they were targeting apartment complexes or something. But right. you don't know that if you downed it before it hit its target. Yeah. And Granted, so, we don't want it to hit any target. <laughs> right. But sure. if you'd rather it hit a military target than a civilian one. Yeah. And so, but it, it did occur to me then at that time, like, why didn't I think of this before? Yeah. Maybe this is... All these like random, I mean, because there's been some uh, civilian assets that were hit that Russia was like very open about. Well, yeah. we attacked it because yeah, um, yeah. the, you know, they'd kicked all the people out of the hospital and they were using it as a defensive point in Mariupol. Yeah. Or um, we attacked the mall because there was a, a, a rocket truck reloading in the back, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it occurs to me that maybe just for your consideration, yeah. maybe a lot of these uh, purely civilian targets that have been hit, they weren't actually attacked by the Russians. They yeah. were damaged when a missile was intercepted. Yeah, yeah. It's in, it's possible, mm -hmm. like I say. I mean, you can't... I mean, they said it right there blatantly yeah. for this one, so... Yeah. Um, and the thing that really concerns me about this, uh, probably more than anything else, and, uh, you know, I was talking about the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense being essentially the same person, is that... What I would like to see from Anthony Blinken, yeah. who's the Secretary of State, this yeah. is supposed to be the the chief diplomatic office in the U.S. Yeah. What I would like to see from Anthony Blinken is him out there trying to meet with Sergey Lavrov, 
um, trying to meet with Russian officials, uh, yeah. out there making it a point to try and get everybody to the table to come to an agreement on this. Yeah. Um, by m- most accounts, the U.S. is actually discouraging the Ukrainians from making any kind of deal. Yeah. Um, that they they seem to be because uh, for, actively discouraging them from from coming to some kind of ceasefire agreement. Because for whatever reason, I've been saying it since the beginning. We don't want peace here. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't. Like uh, th- we've had every opportunity to to facilitate peace with our influence on Ukraine, and we're not doing it. Yeah, and it. I don't understand why. I'm, I I still believe there's something else larger at play here. We don't understand. Mm. Yeah, because the reason this is the reason this started in the first place, and since it started, the reason that it has gone on as long as it has, mm. um, and resulted in as many civilian deaths as it has, is because we have been encouraging the Ukrainians to hold out. Yeah. I mean, there's been like the this very kind of morbid joke going around that um, that the U.S. wants to tear Russia down and they're willing to fight to the last Ukrainian to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 it seem, that seems accurate. Yeah, and I've got a clip from Chaz Freeman uh, for this podcast um, who was a, a, a longtime diplomat, worked at the State Department. Um, his real claim to fame probably is that he was the interpreter during Nixon's trip to China okay. where he met with Mao. Um, but this is a guy that was in... in um, in the state department for 50 years, roughly and held some, uh, high, yeah, high ranking positions in the state department. Um, so I got a clip from him, but I didn't clip this. Now I kind of wish that I had, um, and now I talked about him so long, I forgot what it was (laughs) (laughs) that I I was going to say that he had said, um, in this, uh, something about fighting to the last Ukrainian. Oh yeah. Um, because, uh, it was in an interview with Aaron Mate. Yeah. Um, who I think just works at the gray zone now, uh, yeah. which is Max Blumenthal's outfit. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I will get back to the <laughs> point. I promise. <laughs> All right. Uh, I recommend everybody read management of savagery okay. um, by Max Blumenthal. Yeah. Um, it's a really great book about the, um, about the Iraq war primarily and Afghanistan wars, the beginning of the terror wars. Yeah. Um, and also watch killing Gaza. Uh, which is a documentary film he made um, about the uh, about the Palestinians in Gaza, which is heart wrenching and worth seeing and worth paying attention to, since the film was done by two American Jews. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, um, so Chaz Freeman talking about this fight into the last Ukrainian thing said that it that for the U.S. it's essentially it essentially has no cost. Yeah. Like fighting Russia in this way essentially has no cost for the U.S. Yeah. Um, because they can deny it. They're not a direct participant, although I would say that they are. And I, yeah. I think he would too, actually. But yeah. at least. Well, uh, and, you know, and Putin has to view us as a direct persistence participant yeah i mean i would have to think right yeah like he um, doesn't, but he doesn't want to be involved in a nuclear war either well no absolutely you know the, the, like the whole the point incentives of are the, the same for him as they are for us like we yeah. don't want the bombs to start falling yeah the whole point of these proxy wars that we had throughout the cold war and are apparently still having today yeah. um is that they are that it, you can fight your enemy with it with deniable forces so you don't get direct get into direct conflict yeah because we all know we're direct conflict will lead yeah. yeah um but uh and i thought when when Chaz freeman said it i thought like what uh an incredibly glib view you must have of the world to be so careless about other lives yeah you know? yeah um that yeah we we have a political agenda and we're willing to sacrifice all of these ukrainian lives in order to achieve it yeah and the political agenda isn't even an agenda that the average american would care about yeah. Like, does, do any of, well, you might now because you've been propagandized constantly for the last yeah. month, but, um, hopefully I, I hope that our audience is aware that that's going on and, and can kind of separate themselves a little bit. But, um, at least before all this, did you want to tear Russia down? Yeah. I mean, I mean I, do you care? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like if Russia is a power in the, in central Asia, do yeah. you care? Yeah. What in Eastern Europe do you care? Shouldn't affect us. No. Um and uh so th- anyway, the the diplomatic approach seems to be 
Um, and I, I will say, uh, Anthony Blinken is, um, is a Hillary Clinton type of secretary of state. And yeah. if you'll remember, Hillary Clinton was constantly advocating for war everywhere. Yeah. The, the, and in fact, it seems to me that recently, um, at least in the Democrat, uh, administrations, um, if not also in Trump's administration, that the, the state department is more, uh, advocates for war more than the Pentagon does. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> does kind because of seem it, that way. And it, and it almost makes sense because the state department doesn't have to fight that war. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the department of defense does. So, yeah. uh, but it, it does seem that we're trying to perpetuate rather than end this conflict. Um, we're only seeking punishment uh, for Russia. There's, there's no carrot in this agreement, just the stick. Yeah. Um, Blinken isn't meeting with Russia, but instead he's going around threatening or cajoling everyone else to get in line against Russia. Yeah. Um, he, uh, two weeks ago returned from a Europe trip, um, where he went to France and Germany and the UK, I believe. Uh, but the other countries that he visited were, um, Poland, Moldova, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, yeah. all current NATO members all former Soviet bloc members. Yeah. Um, and so we, we have been um, encouraging uh, anti-Russian feelings in the former Soviet states since the fall of the Soviet Union. We've continued to treat them like an enemy the whole time. Yeah. And they weren't trying to be one. Yeah, right. And, and Russia did ask to join NATO, and they were roundly rebuked. Yeah. <laughs> Which, that's, to me, that's always seemed like the simplest solution to all of us. Just let them join. Yeah. Then, well, then this whole thing won't mean anything. It can just be a drinking party. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it, the, whole, the result of all of this, the, the approach that we're making and, and what we seem to be trying to achieve, um, is to actively divide the world into in-groups and out-groups. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with these kinds of alliances, defensive though they may be, yeah. and, and you know that Russia can't assume that it's defensive. And if I go back to the Yugoslavia and Libya thing, you might question whether it's actually a defensive alliance anyway, yeah. um, especially since NATO is trying to get involved uh, in um, activities in, uh, in, in the Pacific Rim. Yeah. Like, it's not a defensive alliance against China. Yeah. Or, or like, it just doesn't. It just doesn't even make sense. They, they yeah. should have no interest in India, China, Southeast Asia. Yeah. The North American Treaty or North, yeah, North Atlantic Treaty uh -huh. Organization. Yeah. May as well be the North American Treaty Organization now. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's actively dividing the world into in-groups and out-groups because you're either a part of NATO or you're on the other side. Yeah. And we've had this like very black and white look at how all the countries fall in the world, at least since... Bush the younger, yeah. right? Whereas you're either with us or against us, and we've kind of maintained that approach throughout. Yeah. Um, Which, and, by the way, Russia tried to be with us then. Yeah, they like, were with us. They then. were with us then. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and this this method of dividing the world into these groups or blocks, you might say. Yeah. Um, it it doesn't do anything to ensure or promote peace. In fact, it does quite the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and I mean, I don't really have anything else to say that uh, about this. I do want to play, um, this Chaz Freeman clip. All right. So if, do you, if you don't have something that you want to say right here, then we can probably just end on this clip and then do our, do yeah. our stuff. Uh, the only other thing I was going to say was rolling back to the stuff I was talking about earlier. I really encourage everybody to go and listen to some of those here. The, just even if you pull up a super clip or something of the hearings, mm -hmm. Listen to some of that because you definitely, you're not getting the real picture from the media, man. Yeah. So that was the only other thing I was going to kind of say closing out. Okay. Um, well, let's play this Chaz Freeman clip and we can do a little bit of commentary on it afterwards and then we'll close out. Sounds like a plan. All right. After World War One, when the victors, the United States and uh, Britain and France, insisted on excluding Germany from a role in the affairs of Europe, as well as this newly formed Soviet Union, the result was World War II and the Cold War. So instead of, uh, it's really depressing that instead of trying to figure out how to give Russia reasons not to invade countries and to uh, violate international laws it has, um, doesn't make, that does not make Russia unique, of course, 
But instead of, of trying to give Russia reasons for being well behaved, we have, in its view, left it with no alternative but the use of force. This is a very smart man that knows things about diplomacy. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that's yeah. making this comment. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that probably a lot of our listeners are familiar, but, um, but if you're not like all this was predicted. Yeah. I mean, this was all predicted. Um, I, I recommend everybody go to WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks.org yeah. and put in the search term, like look exactly for this term or however, you know, how those advanced searches go is like, look yeah. exact, this exact phrase or whatever. Yeah. Put in, uh, Niet means Niet. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And read the memo. And that's a memo from Bill Burns, our current CIA director, uh, talking about um, re reviewing a meeting that he had with Sergei Lavrov in 2008. Yeah. Um, talking about how uh, Sergei Lavrov was very clear that they cannot allow a military alliance in Ukraine. Yeah. A Western military alliance that's focused, been focused against Russia yeah. in Ukraine. Um, and they'll do what they have to do. And he was like very clear about the whole thing. And and some of the things that he was saying have strong echoes in what's going on now. Because, if, again, if you'll recall, for the last eight years, there's been a conflict in Ukraine, essentially a civil war in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that Sergei Lavrov said that the Russians were concerned about is that uh, the prospect of NATO membership um, may create internal turmoil within Ukraine. Yeah. And possibly result in a civil war. And then Russia would be put in a position where they would have to choose whether to intervene or not. And they didn't want to have to make that decision. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's, it's very prophetic. And even more prophetic than that is to go to um, look up uh, now a word from X. Yeah. Um, just do a Google search. If you have access to the New York Times, you can do it there. If you don't have access to the New York Times, copy the URL that you come up with when you get to the article and go to archive.is and plug in the URL, um, and you'll you'll be able to read the article there. Yeah. Um, but that is a uh, Thomas Friedman article where he was interviewing George Kennan. Um, and again, Kennan was the architect of the containment policy uh, for the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and he is talking about his expectation. And this is in 1998 yeah. um, when we first started expanding NATO. Yeah. Um, and he's talking about his expectation. And he says something along the lines of that uh, he expects that over time um, Russia will uh, react um, quite badly to the expansion of NATO. Oh, um, that they will see it as a security threat. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, it, it will lead to a new Cold War. And he and he's talking about how the people that um, the Russian people, he says, our problem um, during the Cold War was with the Soviet Communist Party. Yeah. The people of Russia now are the people that overthrew that regime. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and that there was nobody threatening anybody in Europe until they started expanding NATO and that that his expectation was that that would change. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Absolutely. and, uh, and he also says that it's very sad to see his life's work fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, both of those things I think are really important for people to understand the background of this yeah. and that this isn't a surprise. I mean, it's not even so much the background. It's that this isn't a surprise. This was something that, that plenty of people saw coming. Yeah. Yeah. That this was a perfectly predictable response to NATO expansion, um, by Russia. Yeah. Um, and the people that were involved with both the, the uh, Soviet communist regime during the Cold War and Russia afterwards predicted. Yeah. Yeah. And it could have been we avoided. Didn't, we didn't have and to. And we're advising against. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. We didn't have to go down this road. Yeah. And um, even now, like, it ain't too, uh, too soon to put on the brakes and fix this, but it's, we're going to hit a point, a tipping point where you can't. Yeah. I don't know where that's going to be or where that's going to lead, but it this this goes nowhere good. Yeah. So you know, back to my commentary earlier. Uh, if Anthony Blinken, by any chance, is listening to this podcast or anybody who's advising him, <laughs> go negotiate with Russia for a ceasefire. Quit yeah. talking to all the enemies of Russia. Go yeah. talk to Russia. Russia is who you need to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. Common sense. Yeah, you would think. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Th- uh, clearly not. Be, like there seems to be a serious lack of that in the U.S. government. So I, yeah. <laughs> um, oh well. I you know we'll see what happens with this. I, I'm still not predicting that we're going to end up in a nuclear war or anything. I'm, you know, everybody understands the consequences there. Yeah, but you can't say we're not closer to it now than we were a few months ago. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're we're closer than we've been in a long time. <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> <laughs> on that happy note, <laughs> yeah, uh, we gotta be okay. How about well, no, I I, I have another clip from Biden um, that I was I was gonna play on this podcast because I, the irony of it makes me laugh. Um, but I don't know that it's really that happy a clip, <laughs> Yeah. uh, but just, you know, it, it's as close to comedy as we, we as, really get <laughs> out right. of a Biden clip anyway, unless you're just making fun of him, yeah. which is it, easy to do. <laughs> yeah. And it's not something that we really do on this podcast. No, so, no. um, so let, let, let's go ahead and play it. <laughs> sure. Putin has issued Russia's energy resources to coerce and manipulate its neighbors. That's how he's used it. He's used the profits to drive his war machine. And the United States welcomed the European Union's powerful statement early this month, committing to rapidly reduce its dependence on Russian gas. You know, I should never play clips like that at the end because it brings up more policy stuff that now I feel like I have to <laughs> no, comment on. No, you have to address it, yeah. <laughs> but um, the, the reason that I thought that that was so funny is because uh, I, I thought what he's saying that Russia does is exa- the exact opposite of what we do. Yeah. He's saying that Russia uses its energy to, to energy resources to coerce its neighbors and uses the profits from those energy resources to fund its military. Yeah. And I thought, wow. We use our military to coerce our neighbors um, and use the military to reinforce profits for the energy sector in this country. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so I, I thought that, that was funny. But then, um, you know, back to the, the Yemen war thing, uh, one of the results of this ban on Russian oil um, is now we are kind of in a position where we are more dependent on cheaper oil from both Saudi Arabia and UAE, yeah. which makes us, which puts us in a position where we're even, where we're even less likely to discontinue the Yemen war because we have to keep them happy now for cheaper oil prices. Yeah, we got to have their oil. I wonder what yeah. Madeleine Albright would say about that. <laughs> so that's a, I, there's at least some, Dark comedy in that to in the yeah. show. You know? It's definitely dark. <laughs> yeah. um, Is a million dead babies worth two dollar gas? Who? No, no, it is not. It's, Absolutely, it is uh, not. It's not. But I'm just saying. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, we. Um, there's no reason to think that we won't be back next week right now. Absolutely. Um, we're we're it may trying be Friday to, again. Yeah, but. it'll probably be Friday again. It'll probably yeah. be Friday for a while. For a while, yeah. Um, Friday or Saturday. We will we will appear sometime between Thursday and Sunday. All right. <laughs> um, that is the that is the new schedule. Yep. Sometime between Thursday and Sunday, we will record yep. and put out a podcast. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so we hope you join us then and. In the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube, uh, which I finally got the video from last podcast up yesterday, I think, on YouTube. Sorry. (laughs) So it Um, is there. (laughs) It is there. I was like, there was a point in the day yesterday where I was like, I made that video. Did I put it up? And then I went to YouTube and I was like, no, I did not. (laughs) Uh, So then I uploaded it. So it's, it's done. Um, and hopefully it won't take me that long this time. Yeah. And hopefully it'll stay up there. Yeah. That's the other, (laughs) we we haven't had one thrown down in a while. We were really only upsetting them with our COVID stuff. Ah, yeah. Um, COVID's over. So that's good news. And whatever they claimed that we said that wasn't allowed has turned out to be true. So uh, whatever. Um, at any rate. Uh, yeah, um, like and uh, share and tell your friends and all of those things that help us get this message out to everybody. Because um, even if uh, even if you don't agree, there needs to be some some opposition research out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Needs to be some opposition <laughs> research. 
Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.